Good morning, faithful listener. You are listening to the Bible Explained podcast, where the Bible gets explained. So grab your cup of coffee and stay tuned as we read through the book of John. Hello and good morning, friends and faithful listeners. This is Jen here with the Bible Explained podcast. And my sister is actually here with me also, my sister Jamie. And I'm sorry that I have two guests two days in a row, but my sister actually begged me (laughs) to do this particular podcast. She kind of did. She begged me to do this particular podcast episode with me, and it happened to be just scheduled for today. And so I was like, yeah, yeah, we can do it together. It's just there's going to be two guests, two days in a row. I don't know if you guys caught my episode yesterday, but I had a young man named Casey on the podcast and we talked about some crazy stuff in Deuteronomy. But Jane, what are we going to talk about today? And obviously reintroduce yourself for those of you who haven't heard you before. Hi, I'm Jamie and I'm Jen's older sister. I've been on here a couple times, so I'm honored to be the second guest after Casey. It was a really interesting episode uh, yesterday. So thanks, Jen. I, I appreciate it. The reason that I wanted to be on this episode is because I love this miracle. I think it's fascinating. And I was a part of a church that taught me things about this miracle that I believe lessen the miracle and are incorrect. And I just have some opinions about it. And I, I just love this miracle. So I thought it's only mentioned in this gospel and it's coming up. So please let me, please let me be a part of this. I love it. And it's true because Jamie and I attended the same church for many years uh, and she's nine years older than me, but she also went to a different church after that, that continued to teach the same thing because it was actually a sister, sister church of the church we grew up in. Yes. Isn't that right? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, we both grew up listening to this miracle being taught very differently than what it actually says. So this is going to be a fun discussion today, I think, about the miracle at Cana, the wedding at Cana. And like Jamie said, this is the only time this is actually mentioned in scripture. But let's go ahead and start reading. I'm going to go ahead and read John chapter 2 verses 1 through 12 today. And as always, I'll be reading out of the W.E.B. The third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Jesus was also invited with his disciples to the wedding. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with you and me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six water pots of stone set there after the Jews' way of purifying, containing two or three metrets apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the ruler of the feast. So they took it. When the ruler of the feast tasted the water now become wine and didn't know where it had come from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the ruler of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when the guests have drunk freely, then that which is worse, you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of his signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. Okay, my first thought about all of this is, James, what were weddings like back in these days, do you think? I've heard that they're quite different. So maybe spanning like days, not just like hours, a feast, great celebration. I, I don't know. And, I, I, you know, since the wedding is often mentioned in scripture as like this awesome event, I'm going to guess that this was like literally an awesome event, like super fun games, dancing, maybe wine feasts. I don't know, like just a ton of stuff going oh, on. And that whole thing with the Jewish wedding where I don't even know if they maybe knew the date. It was kind of like determined by the bridegroom when he was ready to take his bride. And just, I think it was so exciting and anticipated and like, I don't know when it's going to be. And it was just a huge celebration. Because the bridegroom would have to like go out and build a house and like prepare for his family. 
and the the bride would be like waiting. She would have no clue when he would be done. And when he finally came back for his bride, she'd be like waiting for him and expecting him. And then all of a sudden there'd just be this huge party that would be thrown. And it was just like a really awesome celebration of like love, I guess, between two people. So yeah, Jesus is invited to this wedding <laughs> along with his mother. I guess also his brothers were probably there since it sounds like they knew this family potentially. And the disciples were also invited because they were all kind of from the Galilee region. And so it says that on the, in the third verse, it says the wine ran out <laughs> and Jesus, Jesus's mother comes up to Jesus and is like, okay, look, they have no wine. <laughs> So this makes me think that, I, go ahead. Yeah. What were you going to say? Can, can you imagine like, you know, I, I don't know. Like we tried to keep our weddings, me and you tried to keep like our weddings under a budget, but they're still expensive. But you know, these huge weddings, can you imagine if you're like serving the prime rib or something? It's just like, oh, sorry. um, There's none left for you. <laughs> oh, <gotcha>. <laughs> Like, that's really embarrassing. Like, this is a severe problem right, right here. Yeah. I, yeah, I would have been pretty mad myself. We we actually, my wedding, we did like a all, all-inclusive-ish kind of wedding where it was at one location completely. Like, we didn't move around. I got, like, married in the building and we stayed in the building. And the guy, like, that owned that building, like, did all the food. And the food was pretty decent. But I would have been infuriated. I had pot roast at my wedding. I would have been infuriated if he was like, hey, we ran out of pot roast. We don't have enough to serve your guests. I would have been like, excuse me, what am I paying for here? <laughs> and, and understandably, this is not the same thing because wine is different than food. And yeah, apparently yeah. people ate. But the same concept of you don't have enough for your guests. Like this party was supposed to continue and there's no wine. There's supposed to be wine but there's not. It's gone. Exactly. It sounds to me like Mary knew these people quite well. That's what it sounds like to me, because she understood this embarrassment that was going on and didn't want her friends to be embarrassed like this, that they had run out of wine for this like glorious occasion, basically. So Mary <laughs> tells Jesus, she's like, look, they, they ran out of wine. And Jesus says to her, Woman, what does that have to do with you and me? My hour has not yet come. <laughs> so Jesus is kind of like, yeah, that that's not really any of my business. <laughs> it's like kind of what he said. No, why why am yeah. I involved in this? Like this has this has nothing right. to do with me. Yeah, but I want to focus on the word woman here because I think if anybody reading this today saw this, they'd be like, wow, you know, Jesus really disrespected his mother here because Jamie, what did you say that we associate the word woman with now? Well, it's kind of like that whole thing, like the husband that is disrespectful to his wife, like he comes home and he's sitting watching TV and he's like, woman, go make me a sandwich. Like, <laughs> but I mean, that's what I think when I think of yeah. like woman, you know, <laughs> like here in America, the word woman, if you're like calling somebody that is a sign of like disrespect, like you're putting that person almost like on a lesser role is what we've made it out to be. Should it be made out that way? No, because we are women. But <laughs> that's just that's kind of what it is today. Like that's what we associate it with is just a sign of men disrespecting us. But back in these days, the word woman was actually extremely respectful and in fact, woman, it, it doesn't translate well into English. Woman is like the closest thing we have. So the Greek doesn't translate well into English. I should mention that. But there is actually no sign. I read this on Enduring Word. There are no like signs of men back in these days calling their mothers mother. They often called them woman. And so like it was a it was just a sign of respect back in these days, but it doesn't translate well into English, honestly. <laughs> I think of it kind of like ma'am, like not, I don't know, like yeah. for, for anybody that's listening in the South, I think they would understand that. It's just like boys are supposed to respectfully address their mother as ma'am a lot of times, like, yes, ma'am, no, sir. And they do that. And it's really respectful. So I kind of think of it more 
um, on that line. If you know, Yankees like us, we don't, we don't do that. I'm like, no, don't call me ma'am. Just call me mom. That's fine. But you know, I, I went to college in the South and that was a very common and it was very respectful and it was what you did. Yeah. We didn't grow up like that. No, actually funny story. I worked at a factory. I went to this college, right? So we called people, sir and ma'am. That was the thing to do. That's culturally acceptable. And I came back to Pennsylvania to work at a factory. And so my boss, I don't know, he told me to do something. And I was like, yes, sir. And he was just like, he stopped like dead in his tracks. And he just looked at me serious. And he's like, what did you just say? And I was like, yes, sir. And he's like, don't ever say that again. <laughs> he just walked away. <laughs> so Oh, you know what? No, it's common because I remember um, dad actually when he was going to his church like like a year or so ago, he did not like the fact that one of the kids called him sir. Oh, I I remember that. So it is kind of more common, like, I guess, in our area, like in the north, that it's it's not respectful so much like it is respectful. It is. But it's almost like. What are you calling me an old man? Like you want I'm an old of... man, I'm an old woman. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, in the South, it is respectful to call somebody "ma'am" and "sir." That's a really funny story. <laughs> I don't but know. I can see uh, that. anyway. Yeah. Honestly, if somebody came up to me and called me "ma'am," I'd be like, "Nah, you don't have to call me that." <laughs> I would. I'd be like, "You don't. You don't have to call me that." Yeah. So, uh, sorry, we digress. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, we did digress pretty hard. But yeah, like that. Jamie is right. That is kind of what Jesus calling his mother woman kind of is. It's on along the same lines as ma'am, I would say. So Jesus then says, he's like, woman, what does that have to do with you and me? My hour has not yet come. So he's kind of like, this doesn't really involve me, mother. (laughs) My hour hasn't come yet. And what Jesus is referring to here is the fact that he is not ready to die yet obviously like his ministry hasn't even started to begin yet he just got his like first few disciples just recently but honestly this was perfect timing really for jesus to begin his ministry because john the baptist was about to go to prison and we know that jesus took on john the baptist ministry after john went to prison so really this was almost perfect timing for jesus to reveal his glory in a sense. So then I don't know if Mary just like ignored Jesus. (laughs) But she, she says to the servants, she's just like, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. I just love that. So I don't know if it was like ignoring, like almost all of the TV shows that like record this are saying like Mary was kind of just bossing Jesus around or something. I don't see it that way. I kind of see it as she knew the power that he has. And she didn't like say, you're going to do this. You know, you're going to do that. You know, she was just like, do whatever he tells you. So I I don't know. She was just putting it in his hands. I I don't know. I don't see her as being like bossy. Maybe. I don't know. Like, okay. I don't know if you guys have ever seen Napoleon Dynamite. (laughs) That's what I was thinking too. I know the part where the the like Napoleon Dynamite asks the one girl to the prom Trish and Trish. Yeah. And then the mom comes up to Trish and was like, you know, you're going to prom with that boy. (laughs) And like, I don't know if Mary was specifically doing that, you know, like she was saying, like, Jesus, you're going to do this. Like, there's no two ways about it. You got the power, you're going to do it. Or if she was just just telling the servants to do what Jesus says, regardless of whatever Jesus decided to do, because Jesus could have very well been like, I'm not going to really, I'm not going to do this. It's not time yet. Because he has in the past. Like Jesus did, in fact, you know, honestly put Mary in her place in some instances when she was trying to deter his ministry. Yeah. We see that. I think that was in Mark that happened. When Mary was becoming really scared because Jesus was going against the Pharisees, she's, she was trying to get Jesus to stop and like using his her like motherly abilities to try to get him to stop. And Jesus was like, no, like I'm, I'm not stopping this. He did say no. Jesus did say no 
when the situation in like required him to say no but he was very respectful of his mother maybe he just knew this was even though his time to die has not come yet his time to start his ministry is beginning and i mean if we look at her advice do whatever he tells you best advice forever for us for anybody that's what we're supposed to do do whatever he tells you so her advice was good but i mean we just don't know everything around the conversation what this actually meant at the time but you're absolutely right i mean mary did give good advice there (laughs) but what i love about this is the fact that the servants were the ones that got to experience this awesome miracle like the the lowliest of the low were the first people that got to experience this miracle it wasn't the bridegroom it wasn't the bride it wasn't the owner of this venue it was the servants. Exactly. And Jesus came as a servant and he really elevated that position. And that's what he has told Christians to do, to be servants. The greatest among you mm-hmm. will be the servant. Right. And even the first people that uh, knew about his birth were the lowly shepherds that had no money yeah. and no place to live. That's true. Yeah. So Jesus always elevated those who served. I think that is important to note here because we all, we don't often think that, you know, we, we think that if Jesus loves us, he's going to give us stuff. <laughs> that's the whole prosperity gospel. But that's not always the case. I mean, these honestly, these servants were blessed beyond anybody else at this wedding for being able to experience this miracle. Yeah, that's an amazing point. And it is very contrary to what we see because we think, well, God's blessing that person because, look, they have influence, they have popularity, they have money. And um, Jesus came and Mm -hmm. I don't know, it seems like this is his first huge miracle. Um, We don't know anything else that was recorded until this time, but this is his first one. And his birth, like you said, to the shepherds, his first miracle to the servants. Yeah, I agree with that. So Jesus goes up to the servants and it says that there were six water pots of stone used for purification. I think it's interesting to note that those stone pots were used for purification also. I don't know. I I, I think that there's something in that. Jesus's purity, maybe. The fact that this was, I can't, I don't know. I can't put my finger on it, but somehow that's really important. <laughs> That these stone things were used for purification. But you know what? Actually, I just thought of something. The wine is often considered to be Jesus's blood. Oh, yeah. And so Jesus's blood is our purification right in a way. That's how we become pure. Wow. I don't know. I I mean, there's so many layers to this. So it says that the, the the stone water pots contained two or three metrets a piece. And my footnote says two to three metrets, metretes, I don't know, is about 20 to 30 U.S. gallons or 75 to 115 liters. So these are big, giant pots. Each. (laughs) Yeah. Wow, that's a lot of, those are heavy. And that's a lot of wine. That is a lot. I mean, I don't know how much the average like wine making place makes per year but i would guess i don't know i don't i actually live in wine country fun fact about me so we have wineries everywhere i've i used to work at a winery actually for like a hot second (laughs) i hated it there (laughs) i hated that job so much but the wine cellar was a really cool place to be and they had these huge like uh wooden barrels filled to the brim with wine And I don't know how many those held. I'm going to guess about maybe the same amount of wine. I might be wrong. Maybe it was more. But even there, with the huge vineyard that was at this place that I worked, and all the like people they had to hire to pick these grapes and stuff, there's probably only about 12 of those giant wooden barrels. So, I mean, this was an extreme amount of wine, if you think about it. Yeah, like you're thinking there's going to have to be leftover after this. I mean, I don't oh, know. Yeah. Seems like it, depending on how big the wedding. Yeah, but this is like excess because even, I I would doubt even say that winery was filled with people. 
they would even go through like one of those. I, I mean, I might be wrong. I might be totally wrong. And if anybody knows the answer to this, please contact me because I'm not actually 100% sure about wineries. And I mean, I know some things about wineries, but not statistics. But yeah, I'm just curious about that specifically, how much wine w would a person like a, a wedding go through? Hey guys, it's Jen from the future. I was editing this episode and I really wanted to see what the average winery makes or rather how many grapes would be necessary, I suppose, to do this miracle that Jesus did. And so it turns out that a small winery, and when I say small, I mean if they have one acre of grapes, produces about two tons of grapes. And two tons of grapes will make about 120 gallons of wine. Now, considering the fact that these water basins that Jesus was having the servants fill were each 30 gallons and there were six of them, that means that there were 180 gallons there in total. Literally two tons of grapes would have to be collected and pressed in order to create this wine. But let's move on. So it says that Jesus tells them to fill these purifying water containers with water. And so these servants, they do that. They filled them up to the brim. I can imagine that took a long time, actually. That probably took quite a while for them to fill every single pot to the brim with like clean water. Yeah, I mean, they they were hand dipping this water out of a well. So it probably did take a long time for them. And I mean, what were they thinking at this time? Like, OK, what are we what, what are we doing here? We have wa water. What, we're we're going to serve them water like I mean, what? I don't know that whatever hour that they're doing this, I don't know, you know, let's say it was an hour of like, just thinking like, I don't know what we're doing. I bet you they were, they were probably like, what in the world? <laughs> Maybe they thought that like everybody needed to do some sort of purification thing. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> they could have thought that too. Like no miracle is going to happen, but I don't know. They must've known that wine was running out. Yeah. They knew there was a problem. Maybe. I mean, at that point, Hey, we're going to be in trouble anyway. I don't know. Like, hey, let's give them water. Great. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it says they, they filled them up to the brim. And then once that's done, Jesus is like, okay, now draw some out and take it to the ruler of the feast. <laughs> that poor servant. Was probably, like, he did it, though. He did. That. Yeah, that's absolutely true. He listened to Mary's words. The servant or he or she listened to Mary's words and did exactly what Jesus said to do. And you know, Jesus, it says that Jesus grew in favor with God and man. In, um, and, you know, he must have had a good reputation. So it wasn't like they knew Jesus. They knew who he was. And so they trusted him. I don't know what they knew about him or that he could perform these miracles. Who knows? But it did take an amount of faith to go give this cup of wine to you know, you mean water at this right, point, right? This cup of water. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Some sort of faith. There. I think that the servant was really scared. Honestly, it was probably like, oh, my goodness, I'm going to go do this. Jesus said to. But what is this guy going to think when I hand him a cup of water? So it says they took it and then the ruler of the feast tasted the water now become wine and didn't know where it came from. But the servants who had drawn the water knew. So all of a sudden, as the servants taking the water over to the uh, to the ruler of the feast, that sounds like the guy who owns the venue, maybe <clears throat> it, it became wine. I was reading about this ruler of the feast or master of the banquet. Um, mm -hmm. And it, I was kind of thinking, what is he called? The master of ceremonies. And I'm like, oh, the MC kind of. Uh, <laughs> like what we would think of, but maybe he did own that. He was apparently responsible for the food and drink and maybe the music at the wedding. So he, he was in charge. He was the, the guy that was supposed to make sure that this went smoothly. But then my question is, you know, why then did he not try to figure out the wine situation? Who knows? Maybe he was, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he was trying to figure it out. Maybe maybe he really was trying to figure it out. 
And uh, that's why they took this cup over to him. And he just assumed the bridegroom like got took care of it. Who knows? Yeah, we don't know. But anyway, he goes up to the bridegroom after tasting this water turned into wine. And he's like, everyone serves the good wine first. And then when the guests have drunk all that, then they serve the crappy wine, basically. And <laughs> he's like, you kept the good wine until now. So like this was shocking to him that this wine was so amazingly delicious. So this brings me, James, to the question, and this is where we have been taught something different. And for those of you who grew up potentially independent fundamental Baptist or still go to a church like that, you might have been taught that Jesus didn't actually turn this into wine. He turned it into grape juice. That's what we were taught growing up, that any uh, anything referring to Jesus with wine is actually talking about grape juice. So what are your thoughts on that, Jane? Well, where to start on that? Firstly, it says wine, and there's nowhere that indicates that this would be something different than that. Um, the same word for wine used throughout the Bible, good and bad, you know, wine, not grape juice. Um, and, you know, grape juice would have been something that it would be fresh picked um, because grape juice once you break that open it gets in contact with the yeast and it just starts fermenting so obviously if you just squeeze the grapes you can have fresh grape juice but if you have that for longer than maybe a week we're starting to talk about wine here and then you know the longer that it ferments the better it becomes as wine and and that's where you get your good wine and you didn't have a you know grape juice that you could actually bottle up until around 1869, when Thomas Welch, Welch's grape juice, comes on the scene and pasteurizes grape juice, and it becomes actual grape juice that is sustainable as grape juice in its current state. So, little history of grape juice, but there's no indication here. It was a custom that you had wine. So, that would be really unusual. Like, I think um, if it were grape juice, it's unusual now. If, if, it's unusual yes. now. <laughs> like if you're going to do a champagne toast and someone hands you white grape juice, you know, was would anybody be like, wow, that was excellent wine? Are they going to be like, um, what am I? Is it, Do I need a sippy cup? Is this juicy juice? Like what? <laughs> what is going on? Why did you just give me grape juice? Like that doesn't make sense to me. Um, and it kind of makes me laugh at the at that. And I understand that people see this and they're like, but there's drunkenness. Is Jesus promoting sinfulness? Is Jesus saying you should get drunk? Because then why would he give, why would he give you wine uh, if he's not doing that? And I, I think that is a valid question that we need to answer. And we are not saying that Jesus said, yes, get drunk. But we know that Jesus sat down and ate and drank and he was called a drunk. He was called a glutton mm -hmm. and he was not any of those things. Um, that was people just trying to defame him. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And he was not promoting that at all. Alcohol is not evil. Getting drunk and losing self-control is because as a Christian, you're supposed to have self-control. That's a fruit of the spirit. And so if you have too much alcohol, um, you are not going to be able to let the spirit guide you. You're going to be driven by that alcohol. And that's a sin. Drunkenness is a sin, but we can take anything. We can take food. Food is not evil. Being a glutton is evil. That's a sin because that's a lack of self-control or even something like sex. Um, God created sex, but a lot of people think that, you know, oh, that's evil because there's so much evil around it. But between a man and a woman, husband and wife, um, sorry, a man and a woman who are husband and wife, that is a beautiful thing. It creates children and closeness in a relationship, and it's beautiful. But, of course, that can also get tainted. So, no, Jesus is not saying, here, get drunk. He was giving a beautiful product um, in a, for a celebratory purpose right. and not, right. not drunkenness. And. Yeah, we were taught growing up for sure that this was grape juice, specifically because of the 
potential idea of Jesus promoting drunkenness. But really, I don't I agree with you, James. This is not promoting drunkenness in any sense. This is Jesus showing his glory through something that literally cannot happen. Because even so, as you said, go ahead, go ahead with that. Yeah, yeah, I don't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. This is what really got me about this miracle. Grape juice. It would be a miracle if Jesus changed water into grape juice. It really would be um, because nobody can do that. That's that's a miracle. But wine is very different than grape juice. It takes years to have an excellent wine. This is not just like any old wine. This was great wine. I don't know anything about wine. I've just tasted it. Um, my family, we choose not to drink actually um, really at all because we'll cook with wine sometimes, but we don't drink. Um, but the wine here is amazing wine. And you know, if you have a great vintage wine, there's certain years and it can go for tons of money. We're talking about the greatest wine here. And so the miracle just gets that much more complicated. And, you know, there's a lot of people that try to discredit God and his miracles and say like, oh, well, that miracle wasn't really a miracle because, you know, the wind was blowing or this and that, like all these kinds of ways that you can disprove a miracle. And oh, this miracle wasn't, you know, what they did was Jesus told them to go smash up grapes and then they put it in the uh, the containers and made grape juice with this wine and they thought it was good. And, you know, just, okay, no, no. This was a miracle of miracles. Like Jesus made an amazing, probably vintage tasting wine that, you know, they've never tasted like that before. And, and he made it in a matter of seconds as this cup is passed to the master of feasts. Yeah. And I was talking to Jamie a little bit. We, my area, we do ice wine around here and it's delicious. I don't know if you guys have ever had ice wine, but it is like drinking like it's like drinking thick apple juice it's just really good and it's extremely sweet and it's wine because the grapes have to freeze they call it a dessert wine yeah it's a dessert wine like that and port i think port i don't get it i'm food. sorry i don't get it because since i'm not used to it like i just like smell wine i'm just like no i don't get it <laughs> <laughs> i just haven't acquired the taste so yeah. Because I worked at a winery and I, I do drink wine. I like wine, actually. And so um, I'll sit down with a good bottle of wine and I'm a I'm a I'm a red wine drinker. Now, my husband, on the other hand, can't even handle any kind of red wine whatsoever. He needs like the sweetest sugar garbage that like exists. <laughs> so, but we both like ice wine because ice wine is just unique. It's different. It's not made in a lot of areas of the world. And uh, it's it's really good. So every once in a while, we'll we'll treat ourselves to a bottle of ice wine. It's good. And so I was talking to Jamie. I'm like, maybe this was like a dessert wine that Jesus made, like some sort of like ice wine. I don't know. I mean, it's not beyond Jesus's capabilities to create an ice wine, even though Judea never, ever, ever would have had ice wine because it doesn't get that cold because the grapes have to like freeze on the vine in order to create an ice wine. And so, um, so I was talking to Jamie, I'm like, maybe this was just like something beyond anything they've ever tasted. This wine, like a delicious ice wine that you can only find in like Germany <laughs> <laughs> or like Canada or something. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think it's beyond Jesus's capabilities to make something that delicious that nobody ever would have tasted before in that region. Because yeah, I mean, it, you can see possible. Yeah, and I mean, you can see here that, that people are like flabbergasted over this, like the taste of it. So you never know like what this was. I don't know. And then, you know, even for him to know, because you know, like when you're full, everything kind of just tastes like meh. So when you like have had a lot of wine, you've had a lot of food, you're just kind of like, okay, like I'm not hungry, you know, it's not the first thing I taste. It's just kind of meh. So if he is noticing like, whoa, this is not just meh. This is, this is the most amazing thing I've ever tasted. And I don't even, I'm not even like desiring it right now. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and he even said like, everybody's like already drunk the other stuff pretty freely. And yet you saved all this delicious wine for last. 
So then after this, it says Jesus in verse 11, it says, this is the beginning of his signs that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples, his disciples believed in him. And so, I mean, the only people that really knew about this miracle, I'd guess, is Jesus's closest family members, the servants and his disciples that he had at the wedding there. So, I mean, this was uh, Jesus beginning to show his glory to people and also to like the lowliest people at that wedding. And something just so unusual, like he solved a problem and it was just in the most miraculous and awesome of ways with something that never have been conjured up. No, you know, this couldn't be a fake. This was absolutely amazing. Well, friends and faithful listeners, thanks for tuning into this episode. I do hope that you enjoyed it, even though I have done two long episodes in a row. <laughs> that's all right, though. I'm sorry. I feel I'll like that's back. kind of my fault. Last time we did that, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's OK. I mean, it's it's good to change things up a little bit, but I'll go be going back to my normal shorter episodes of about 20 minutes starting tomorrow. And of course, my sister will be back on at some point in the future. So, yeah, James, thanks for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. And I think this was a really great discussion. Thanks for having me, Jen. I really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. And I'll see you guys uh, bright and early tomorrow morning for an episode out of Deuteronomy. Until then, happy listening and God bless.